excellent advice for living. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Of course, the question then comes, but is it excellent, though? Well, you will be the judge, but I'm confident you'll walk away smarter, happier, and richer because the source of that excellent advice for living is the co-founder of Wired, author and futurist, all-around great human being, Kevin Kelly, who this week rejoins me on Rule Breaker Investing. Kevin first appeared in February 2018 on this podcast, talking about his book, The Inevitable, reviewing some of the technological forces he viewed as inevitable for our future. This time, though, he's down to something more practical. His new book's title are the four words with which I let off this week's podcast, Excellent Advice for Living. Plus, we'll also later look back at his predictions in his book, The Inevitable, grade him a little bit for his work, and update his viewpoints for the year 2023, chatbots and all. Get ready for a wide-ranging, cerebral, speculative, compelling, and I hope you'll agree, excellent podcast this week, only on Rule Breaker Investing. It's the Rule Breaker Investing Podcast with Motley Fool co-founder David Gardner. Welcome back to Rule Breaker Investing. Well, I closed last week's podcast by reading one of my favorite quotes from Kevin Kelly, my guest this week on Rule Breaker Investing. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. This, by the way, since we recorded it just a few days ago, is a long podcast. This is one of our longer podcasts in Rule Breaker Investing history. But if you're like me, and you know, you might not be, but if you're like me, you wanted this to go longer. This is a very special, wide-ranging conversation, probably worth listening to more than once. And you can probably listen in the future back to this time and appreciate it then, too. So, I really appreciate the time that Kevin Kelly gave us, and I bet you will, too. Kevin Kelly needs little to no introduction most places, but maybe particularly here on Rule Breaker Investing. Having recently crested the age of 70, Kevin may now fairly be said to be an eminence grise in the world of technology, cultural pattern recognition, futurism, optimism, and yeah, life, living. Living now, too. Indeed, his new book, Just Hitting Bookstores, this week is your next must-read, and it's entitled, Excellent Advice for Living. Back in 1985, Kevin was involved with the launch of The Well, the pioneering online community, and then later Kevin helped launch Wired. In 1993, he was executive editor for its first seven years. His most recent book before this week, and the subject, at least in English, and the subject of our Valentine's Day 2018 podcast was The Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. Longtime technology journalist David Pogue had this to say about Kevin, and I know you love this line, Kevin. I wish he'd said this about me. This is such a great line. Quote, <laughs> anyone can claim to be a prophet, a fortune teller, or a futurist, and plenty of people do. What makes Kevin Kelly different is that he's right. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Well, thank you. That's a great intro. I really appreciate that. I'll take that flattering compliment, even if it's not true, but thank you. (laughs) You do remain the official senior maverick at Wired, and I remain the official chief rule breaker at The Motley Fool. So we get to have a senior maverick and a chief rule breaker hang out together for a little while. And I wanted to start just with your new book, because it's your new book, and it's not something that comes out every year. At least I think of 2016 as having been your most recent big new book. But Kevin, off the air, ahead of time, you were mentioning that some of your stuff's just going straight to China these days, or Japan hasn't even appeared in English. Did you say that you have more fans in China than in the U.S. right now? Oh, yeah. I I have many more fans, and I am a bigger uh, person there than I am um, here. And that was a matter of luck, because um, my first early book's were translated late into Chinese, but just at the right moment when the internet was beginning. So Jack Ma and Pony Ma and all those guys read my book in Chinese, and they found it very, very, very helpful for them starting their businesses, and they recommended it to everybody. So naturally, every entrepreneur in China has to read Out of Control 
and the Technium. And so um, it became required reading. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of like the Alvin Toffler uh, of China. <laughs> I mean, universally recognized, really. I, I think it's this, right. if I read it right, this quarter in Earth history, there will be more Indians on this planet than Chinese yeah. for the first time. Yes. Um, although yes, it's yeah, very yeah, yes. close. Uh, and so you've already got the U.S. pretty well covered, and I would say a lot of the Western <laughs> world. You've now got China. Do you have designs on India? I do. And I spent an awful lot of time in India, and, and I make the claim, which I'm still hoping, hopefully to be disproved, which is I, that I've seen more places in Indian than any Indian that I've met. Wow. Love it. Because I, I spent years traveling in India in my former life. Of course, that was a different Indian than it is today. But um, yes, I, I, I do I do think that I um, am simpatico with <laughs> India, <laughs> and we will resonate there. Um, and and so uh, I would be looking forward to that if that does happen. But you're right; we've got um, these superpowers arising, and and that's you know that may be part of the mix is that. The, the role of the U.S. is shifting, and um, you know that's part of what's happening right now. Well, we're going to talk about what's happening right now. It's fun to do that um, on any given week, but especially fun with Kevin K Kelly. And, of course, a lot of our focus will be on the future. In fact, I'm going to backload this podcast, Kevin, by let's retrogressively go back to some of what you wrote in the inevitable, and let's update mm. ourselves for 2023 going forward from here. I am really looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I got the proof for your new book ahead of time. Thank you for mm -hmm. sending me the PDF. I've read it. It's very different from your other books. Those uh, who don't already know this, I would describe it as Ben Franklin. I would describe it as <laughs> um, aphorisms. I would, you know, think of it as yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So that's really what we have here, from page five to page two hundred eight per page, one to three quotes. Very thoughtful. Could you briefly tell the story? Your introduction is the longest part of the book, and it <laughs> itself is two pages or so. What's the backstory, the superhero origin story for this book? It began in some ways um, by the realization that um, I had lots of pieces of advice I'd been writing down for myself to help me memorize them and re be reminded. Yet I had not given it to our adult kids, and we were the opposite of hel helicopter parents. I have three kids who are young adults now, and they, um, we were not. I was not in the habit of giving them much advice. Um, we preferred to try to act out our advice by by deeds rather than words. But I felt that there were some things that, as I was writing them down, that I really genuinely wished that I had known when I was younger that somebody had told me. So I thought, well, I should really continue to write these down and then give them to my my children, which I did the first batch when I was 60 on my birthday. I did a kind of a Irish hobbit version of, of a birthday where you give <laughs> presents instead of get them. Lovely. And so um, – and that seemed to work and they really enjoyed them and – Later on, when my son saw the book, he said, yeah, you never said this, but you definitely taught us this. And I thought, okay, I'll take that as a sign of success. It's wonderful. Um, but, but there were things that um, he appreciated having written down. And the reason to write them down for me was to encapsulate a whole bunch of knowledge and wisdom into this little tiny telegraphic capsule that would make it easy for me to repeat to myself and remember and and some of it is you know grand and cosmic and universal and timeless but others are very very specific practical things such as um if if you if you lose track of something in your house that you know you have but can't find it and you finally do find it here's the thing i repeat to myself don't put it back where i find it put it back where i first looked for it Put it back where I first looked for it. So I repeat that to myself. Or another piece of advice that's very practical that I got while working at Whole Earth was um, if you get invited to do something six months from now, ask yourself, would I want to do this if, if it was tomorrow morning? Mm -hmm. And that kind of immediacy really filters out things because there's lots of things that I would say yes to in six months, but if it was tomorrow morning I'm going to say no to. So I say no. 
And so um, those are the kinds of things that, that kind of I repeat to myself. Um, and, you know, um, if there's an argument with, um, you know, two sides, find the third side. That's always, that's something I repeat to myself. Okay, there's two sides, you know, dichotomy, back and forth, black and white. It's like, well, what's the third side? And so um, those are the kinds of things. And I attempted to 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 reduce these little books of wisdom into a something that could almost be tweetable. And that was where most of my work was going into was taking away words until just the essence left. And they were something that you, um, could be easily brought to mind. Very well said. And that is indeed what you have done throughout Excellent Advice for Living. You have captured the essence of the wisdom that you've encountered, that you've said to yourself, spoken to, actually acted out yeah. in front of others, as it turns out, not sure. always spoken to them, but now spoken for us. And I asked you ahead of time if you would consent to me randomizing different pages of your book, and then just picking my favorite quote off that page and doing the interview that way. And you said you would allow us to go where our whims are, in this case, my dice, take us. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're going to start, Kevin. I've lined up about eight quotes here, and this was randomly chosen. In fact, the order we'll be talking through these was itself randomly chosen. I guess a, a less lazy interviewer would have actually sculpted everything, but I'm this is how I roll, and I think you're really good with that, too. So let's start with the first quote. For each of these, I'm just going to spot you up. And there might be a story or an anecdote that you have in mind or simply additional thoughts you have for each. And I kind of love that the first one I randomized was from page 85. And this is what you write on page 85. All the greatest prizes in life, in wealth, relationships, <laughs> or knowledge— Come from the magic of compounding interest by amplifying small, steady gains. All you need for abundance is to keep adding 1% more than you subtract on a regular basis. Now, I literally randomized that first, but <laughs> that couldn't be a better Motley Fool setup, I don't think. I, know, I was like, are you sure, are you sure that you weren't cheating there? Because that <laughs> seems also familiar to me. Um Yes, it's true. That, and, and my point is that it's not only true for money, for those little magic coins, but that it's actually true for relationships. It's actually true for skills. It's true for civilization as a whole. If we as a civilized society can create 1% more than we destroy, then we can uh, make civilization that way. In fact, that's all civilization is. I mean, there's just plenty of destruction and problems, but we create a few percent more than we um, destroy, and that compounded over time gives us our society today. So, so it is absolutely true for finance, but it's also true for other things like relationships. If you can be, you know, if you can love a few percent more than than you than you are. Um, you know, uh, when you're being nasty or mean, you can actually compound that over time and accumulate um, something good. And, and, and so there is this magic force, as Einstein says, this marvelous force in the universe, but it does apply even beyond. Um, the little stacks of bills. And of course, we do spend a fair amount of time at The Motley Fool thinking about the compounding effect of money and interest, yeah. as you say. And certainly, that is, in some ways, an easy read because it's numbers. It's numerical. You can actually right, play right. it out forward in a spreadsheet. You can quantify it, enumerate it. Whereas when you start saying, well, relationships, that takes us off into a right brain qualitative assessment. And I really mm-hmm. appreciate that in your mind, and I think mine too, I find this persuasive, it's apply, it's everything's compounding. Everything, it's, all of silly, yes. everything is compounded up to this moment for better and for ill that you could, you and I could share in this discussion. So 
everything is compounding. What we do as parents compounds. Yes. I love you described earlier your approach to parenting, where it sounds like you really didn't offer much guidance. You just tried to do it through action, and that itself sometimes it compounds in ways we don't appreciate or know for better or for ill. I also have adult children who sometimes say, "You know, Dad, you said this when I was this age." I was like, "I, I, I did. I have no recollection." Again, for better you're, or you're for worse. You were actually listening. <laughs> <laughs> so everything is compounding, but certainly from a Motley Fool standpoint, I just love that I hit this one first. And this won't be the only one because, Kevin, there are other aspects of thinking about finances and life, which is not yeah. the focus of this interview, but it's clearly part of your focus in life and part of your knowledge base and, and your interest. Presumably, you've been a saver through your life. I hope you, you own some stock or you own oh, some shares of the things that you created. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, another piece of advice, I'm sh- I don't know if you get to, but was, you know, it, again, I was very practical. It was like, um, you know, uh, actually, I don't even know if it was in the book, but it was something I, I have. A, I have a granddaughter now and I was saying to the granddaughter, it was kind of a funny joke, but I was saying, forget crypto, kid. He'll you know, invest in index stocks, you know, and mutual funds. So, um, um but yeah, it, 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 I have been, and you know, I've been a buy and hold guy, and um, through through everything, thick and thin. And I remember, I remember back in the eighties, I guess it was. It must have been in the eighties. Uh, there was a curmudgeonly guy at Holworth Catalog, and there was like the first time in my recollection where the stocks were going down. It was kind of like a, I'm not sure what the event was. Um, maybe it was, was Black Monday, the, 1987. Who knows? That stock no, went down no, a lot. It, in that yeah, time. maybe it was. Maybe it was 87. And he was saying, "Oh, you know, sell, 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 whatever it was." I was saying, "No, bye, bye, bye." <laughs> this is like <laughs> this, is, this is. If I had cash, I'd be buying right now. But um, I have been, and, and we have been very fortunate in that way um, to, you know, uh, again, in index funds is primarily what what I do. I don't have time to be to do the kind of research that you need to, to be good at this. So I'm a lazy investor, and um, the, you know I've been served well by, by by hanging. Yeah, it worked. Compounding works, and uh, yep. certainly I I uh, I prefer investing directly in individual stocks, as I'm sure you right, know right. we love here at the Fool. But cer- right there with our first book, the Motley Fool Investment Guide. We started by saying everybody could or should just index, and for most people, that's yeah. what makes the most sense. And and at right. that time, anyway, there was so much marketing of managed mutual funds that index funds looked even better because they were just so much cheaper, and the way to really yep. Yep. compound was to not be paying so much in fees. Anyway, exactly. let's move on to random quote number two. We're skating backwards 35 pages to page 50. This one is very practical and very short. And it implies maybe that you're a builder in a physical, architectural mm-hmm. way that, that I'm certainly not. Mm-hmm. Here it is, Kevin. A balcony or porch needs <laughs> to be at least six feet, two meters deep, or it won't be used. Yeah, th- th- this is absolutely true. Bear, born out of my observation of many, many travels around the world, Staying in many places and in rooms and hotels and homes, but it also came originally. The insight came from Christopher Alexander in pattern language. Um, he was he was the one to point it out to me this um, phenomena. And um, I have had Arctic friends tell me the same thing that um, when they're designing things is is that people tend to kind of want to have like a token balcony, but it's just simply never used you you have to have enough depth in there to actually you know go out and make it more than just uh, uh, a design flourish and so um so i've had the privilege of making a house from scratch from cutting down the trees to building the you know lumber moving rocks and i've had uh, worked on this house many times and i've um, designed uh, some houses for my kids so, um, yes, I do have some experience in the making part of it, but um, uh, this is true for anybody who has an opportunity to kind of make a space. Just keep that in mind. And I was wondering, as I read this one, 
whether you intend it just to be what it says or whether you're being <laughs> abstract <laughs> and inspirational, like Chauncey Gardner from the movie Being There, that great Peter Sellers character, if you remember, who would just speak uh, in very open-ended aphorisms. But are, are you yeah. just talking here literally about balconies and six feet, or is there something more you're saying? I, I think, to be honest, I was talking about balconies, but I'm sure we could expand that to the cosmos. Well, as an English major, I learned that if you can kind of BS your way, you get better grades. If you see more connections than might have been intended, that can be rewarded sometimes. I'm not intending to be cynical about my education. I love that I was an English major. Okay, well, let's, let's move on to number three, but I'm really glad, again, randomly that I started with those two because I think listeners and future readers will see there's a lot of range here. You're not just it's not just mm-hmm. all self-actualization or the future of technology, Kevin. You're taking us all over the place in excellent advice for living. Okay. Quote number 3, this one 4 pages later, page 54. As I've been saying this by the way, you've been pulling out your book. This is of course just an audio podcast, so people right, can't, right, right. I'm, I'm people can't checking, see. Checking, yeah. but I wasn't so, no, it, not so. at all. Actually, as somebody who's an author uh, myself in the past, I know it's very helpful to have your own book, especially for yeah. the book tour, because often you've written it a year before and you can't quite remember what you said. But yeah, excellent advice exactly. for living, page 54, and I quote, over the long term, the future is decided by optimists. Mm. To be an optimist, You don't have to ignore the multitude of problems we create. You just have to imagine how much our ability to solve problems improves. Yes. I have become deliberately more optimistic as I get older. I think the kind of optimism I'm talking about is a choice and less of a kind of a sunny disposition. It's more of a choice where... um, It's an act of imagination primarily to imagine um, things working out good and well, things improving over time, um, because to imagine things getting worse is easy. It's cheap. It's very cheap to imagine how things go wrong because that is the probable destination. That's That's entropy. Entropy is most things are going to fail. Most things are going to break. It's easy to imagine them breaking. It's much harder to imagine how things work well. And we have this problem right now with AI. It's far easier to imagine all the ways that it doesn't work and harder to imagine how it works. But if we can, if we can, then um, we're rewarded by it becoming more likely that it will happen. Okay. And so uh, more likely that the good version will happen. And um, so, so overall, it isn't that we are ignoring the problems. It's just that we're imagining and, and seeing how, in fact, our ability to get better and how future generations can improve things, so that our um, that, that we can have that we are actually more successful at solving problems. We will no doubt make new problems beyond beyond what we have right now. And the only reason why we don't despair is because we will also continue to make solutions and the ability to solve those problems even faster. And that's that 1% difference. That, that difference may only be 1%, by the way. I'm, is, remember what I'm saying is that there may only be a, a 1% difference in our ability to solve the problem versus having the problems. But that 1% is all we need. That's the that's my protopian vision. That's, that's yes. protopian. Yes, and I was going to rock that because I remember you and I talked about that, and certainly you wrote yeah. about it in The in- Inevitable. We're not living in a utopia. I think we can all agree on yeah. that. <laughs> we're pretty sure we're not living in a dystopia. I think things would be a lot, a lot worse. But what you have said for many years now, and you just alluded to it again, is we're living in what you call a protopia, which by my layman's definition is basically things are getting infinitesimally better each day like maybe less than 1% but right. every day and you know maybe some days they get a little bit worse that day but invisibly so and right. so and, and we that's have also a hard on a global time. average because there's obviously parts of the world absolutely that are, or or are going backwards but as a global average on average there's an infinitesimal amount with local 
you know, disruptions and local setbacks. That's right. Just as just as you might have your own, any body would have an illness. That was one of the, one of the. Uh, there was a doctor that I worked with, uh, an author, who who um, he said, you know, if you do a really honest appraisal of your body every day, each every day you're going to find some little injury, some little cut, some little boil, something. There's there's not there's not a single day when your body is perfect and that is just sort of the the cost of living so to speak and it's the same thing with our global uh civilization that there are going to be always illnesses and and cuts and injuries but that we overcome them over time and and that by the way is another bit of advice i believe that optimism can be learned and we we know from studies that this is true and uh, one of the differences, or one of the main skills, if I would have to say, it's, it's actually a skill. Optimism is a skill. One of the skills of optimism is that you understand that setbacks are temporary. Setbacks are temporary. They're not your identity. It's the pessimist believes that the setbacks is their identity. That that's inevitable. That they're fated to it. You can't escape it. But. An optimist views setback as temporary, something that can be overcome. That's a great definition, and uh, you've already said optimism is a choice. That's what you said initially. Right, right. Optimism is a skill. It can be learned. It reminds me of um, a friend of mine who's a world-class executive coach, Heath Decurt. Heath often, with his clients, will say, hey, what's the best you can see for yourself? Uh, you know, <laughs> Great th- question. this summer or coming out of your book tour or the rest of right, your right, life. Right, right. And that knee jerk question forces people to articulate yeah. in their minds what might be the best. And guess what? You're much more likely to get near there if you've thought about it than just locking your way into the best. Right, right. So I hear a very similar thought. There's one other friend of mine I want to mention, Madison Perry, who, when ChatGPT started to make its big pop culture splash starting late last year, Madison, who tweets out sometimes on Twitter, said something to the effect of, what does it say about us? And this is my question for you. This is not merely rhetorical, Kevin. I'll ask you directly. What does it say about us humans that so many people are just trying to break ChatGPT and mess (laughs) with it and make it say stupid stuff or show its shortcomings. And I don't think he's necessarily being cynical. This is a positive inquiry. What does that say about humans? Actually, I'm not bothered by that because that to me is much more in tradition of what um, the origins of the word hacking came from. This is what the hackers were doing Love it. back in the old days at MIT. They were hacking the system. They were trying to jailbreak it. They were trying to see where what would work and not work as a means of exploring it was a, it was and that's what a lot of the people who are hacking the chat gpt are doing trying to you know jailbreak it is 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 they're kind of probing the limits of it which i think is a very natural kind of fun thing to do i don't think it's that malicious where they actually are trying to you know that they, they were some guy who was asking chat gpt about how to um, eliminate humans on earth you know and I mean, it was it was what it wasn't a serious intention to try and do that. It was more kind of saying what what it would it say, and so um, so so I think at this level that we're talking about right now, it's a it's a form of hacking, it's an exploration, it's testing the limits, it's like you know quality control in some senses that the consumers are doing the quality control of like where does this break, which is what um, you know software people do all the time. There are people who are hired, and that's their job is to see if they can break it. And that's sort of what was happening here. That's really well said. I appreciate that. You know, I just finished a good book. You may have come across Jordan Ellenberg and his book, How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking. But in his book, he he highlights Charles Darwin as being mm-hmm. distinctive in his era for as soon as he started having a hunch about evolution, he was his harshest critic. He spent yep. a lot yep. of time just attacking his own ideas, whereas most of us are looking, of course, for confirmation bias. We sure. want things that show that we're right, and Darwin was kind of the opposite, and it's that hacker mentality with a capital yep. H and a positive, a positive connotation for many 
I know hacking or hackers sounds negative, but I love that point. Let's move on to quote number, random quote number four. Again, this is my own order. Kevin has no responsibility other than he wrote each of these things. But (laughs) the next one I have for you is on page 134. This one is quite concise. I mean, the entire book is concise. Every page has one to three quotes, each of which is about a sentence long. This is one of them. You can be whatever you want to be. So be the person who ends meetings early. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, So part of writing this was a joy in these little poems. Um, And so, yeah, the the way this structured is you're, 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 you're winding up for a kind of a big reveal and the reveal is a very <laughs> pragmatic request to end meetings early, um, which um, I have to say is I awesome. know a couple of people. I know a couple of people who who try and do that, and they are heroes in my eyes because um, um, you know letting out a meeting, you're stopping when it's really done, when there's nothing more to say. I have another bit of of, of advice elsewhere in the book. I don't know if you got to it, but. Another way to actually um, contain and trim and reduce meetings is is to have a requirement, particularly as the meeting is near the ending, that um, a person is only allowed to speak if you are going to say something that nobody in the group knows. Mm. Right? It has to be like, is this new information that we all need to know? Um, and, and that's what it comes to. Then you can say something. If it's not... The meeting's over. So, um, um, yeah, so so you can see I have a definite bias against um, meetings. And I just love it. I'm going to say it one more time. You can be whatever you want to be. <laughs> so be the person who ends meetings early. Let's go to the, <laughs> the, the fifth quote. This one from page 58. And I quote, Superman and Mother Teresa never mm. made art, only imperfect beings can make art because art begins in what is broken. Yes. Saints and superheroes don't make art. And that is, is because there, there, there is a sense in which the art that we create is in some ways coming from our flaws, coming from what is, is not working, the yearnings that we have. I'm going to talk about really the good expressive art, not just the mechanics of, you know, putting paint on paper or whatever, but the actual expression is coming from our flawed nature rather than our perfected nature. And this is an encouragement to people to make art. So it's not like you have to arrive at some level of enlightenment or, or, or pure being or some kind of spiritual plateau. It's actually the reverse. You want to start when you are hurting. You want to start where you are, you want to start with your imperfection and lack of skills, all those things is is the place from which the great art is coming. And so um and so it's 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 this idea that it's coming out of imperfection rather than perfection. Really appreciate that. And art um <laughs> like leadership It almost means nothing because so many people have defined it so many different ways that it becomes unclear what it is. I do appreciate people like Les McCune who have very practical, pragmatic, simple definitions for leadership. And I appreciate what you've just done there, Kevin. I was thinking about – this isn't exactly art, but it's about not trying to be perfect, not trying to be 100%, acknowledging we're broken. I think of the software world – I was. Had a fun chat um, a weekend or two ago with my friend Zach, who used to work at Activision Blizzard. And at Activision mm-hmm. Blizzard, they would ship when it was at 90%. And I'm sure you're familiar <laughs> with this concept in Silicon Valley. Because if you try to get your piece of software or your game done at 100%, you'll never actually finish. Right. And so that concept of shipping something that's broken in one sense yeah. is really the only way we can muddle through and succeed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I have been making a piece of art a day for several years, and um, so I have a couple other things to say about art in the advice book. And one of them is a definition that I picked up from somewhere um, that 
art is whatever you can get away with, which is my <laughs> which is my favorite example. And I tell my son who wanted to be an artist, I told him the same thing. It's like whatever you can get away with, and 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 um, it, hanging around some professional artists. I mean, people who make their living artists. This is a hundred percent true, where they are basically they convince you that what they're working on is art and therefore it becomes art. It's important to realize that art is something that we can do every day and it doesn't require superpowers to do it. Um, it, If you can convince someone else that it's there. Um, Another piece of advice that I had about art was art is what you leave out. Yeah. Well said. And, And a lot of the great art is knowing when to stop what to take away, what not to say. Screenwriters in Hollywood know that um, it's in what is left unsaid. It's not the words that are there. It's all the things that you skip over, that you don't say, that really make a piece of dialogue work. And music, of course, is all about, it was all about the spaces between the notes. It's not about the notes. And so um, that idea of art is what you leave out is another important, uh, I think, piece of advice. I wanted to ask you about art and making art because, Kevin, I do follow you on tw- Twitter where you are, at Kevin2Kelly. I don't see a blue check mark there. You won't see one on mine either. I don't know. Or maybe I've missed one. Or maybe, are you, are you, are you opting into the Elon's blue check mark or not? No. So I was, I was bestowed a blue check mark long ago. I didn't ask for it, and then it suddenly appeared. <laughs> Um, just last week or this week, it disappeared. And so, um, it hasn't really so far, changed your world. So, so far I have not, I mean, I have no objection to paying for things. I, for instance, right now I pay for search. I moved from Google three years ago to Neva. And, um, what I wanted was a ad free version of search. And I would happily pay Google for an ad free version of of search i would love to i've been actually you know emailing these guys saying you i pay for a youtube premium which has changed my life it, it literally i mean i watch so much youtube and just not having to see any commercials is worth more than a hundred dollars a year to me so i don't want to see those ad sponsored links in my search i'd be willing to pay so i pay neva for ad free search which was started by some other guys from from google and so I have no adver- aversion to paying for a social media. It's just that so far, um, they're not. I mean, how about an ad-free version of Twitter, right? Okay. I mean, so 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 let's go in that direction. And then I'd be willing. That's really interesting. Well, on Twitter, you're at Kevin Two Kelly. Did you insert the two with intention, or was there some other dude named Kevin Kelly who showed up first? Exactly. So so the problem is Kevin Kelly actually is a very 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 common name. I went to school, high school with a Kevin Kelly. There was a Kevin Kelly at Wired, another one. There was another one at Whole Earth. I'm surrounded by Kevin Kellys. And unless I'm there early, I, I don't get the name. <laughs> well, um, you were on then Twitter I, I just, pretty early, I even Kevin. gave up even trying to. So now I'm just Kevin 2 Kelly <laughs> as a way to have my, my own Google unique name. Well, you were certainly on Twitter pr- pretty early, March 2007, but I guess that wasn't quite early enough. But I did want to ask you, following you on Twitter, each day I see a piece of visual art that is uploaded, it seems to me, by you to your account. And it's always tagged AI art, daily AI, I made AI art. Are you text prompting something or are you sculpting these Photoshop images? They're quite alluring and interesting and creative. What is going on there? Yeah. So for one year, I made art myself with my iPad and uh, very fabulous app called procreate that costs all ten dollars it's just fabulous and i was making a new piece of art every day and posting it and then this year i decided to switch over to having ai help me co-create the art and i'm using a bunch of different um engines the one i use most often is midjourney which was the original one but i sometimes use stable diffusion or dolly and what I'm doing is, um, yes, I am giving it prompts, but what you have to understand is to get anything really good from these requires a long conversation. I will spend hours and hours going back and forth and round and round and nudging it 
and uh, backtracking and deciding that I'm not really getting where what I want and starting over again. And sometimes these days we can actually upload images to help it along. So there is a lot of work. There's a whole new art called prompting that is so required to get something really, really good. You can get something instantly by clicking it. But if you want to get something that's not just average and mediocre, you have to work at it. And so that's why I am perfectly um, content and proud of signing it as a co-creation because I have put in my hours. Yeah, that is really interesting. And I thank you for telling the story because I do follow you. I'm interested in the art that you're creating. I suspected it, 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 you're tagging as AI. So yeah, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. we might get into that a little bit later, but some people are, of course, objecting to this and uh, some sure, people feel like their whole property has been that. stolen, et cetera. We may get there or not, but I want to go back to your book because we're having so much fun there, and we just talked about Superman and Mother Teresa, Superheroes and Saints Don't Make Art, coming from a, a broken place. Let's just uh, do a few more, and then we'll shift to the inevitable. So uh, number six comes from page 132. Number six in our interview, this is the six that Kevin and I are doing of his stuff. We tend to overestimate what we can do in a day and underestimate what we can achieve in a decade. Miraculous things can be accomplished if you give it 10 years. A long game will compound small gains that will be able to overcome even big mistakes. And I'll put an end quote right there. But I want to add, first of all, this is a second one that speaks again to compounding and small things growing. And you know mm-hmm. I'm a sucker for these themes. But what I like about this one is you're also pointing out one of the things I've tried to point out about stock market investing in my own experience, both acting on my own advice and what I've provided to others. And that is losers are overrated. We make fearful, too fearful losing in life. The most you can ever lose, and I've done this only once or twice, is 100%, unless you're doing some crazy, silly thing. (laughs) But the most you can make is infinite. And if you do the math, losing is so overrated and not worthy of the fear people accord it. So, to quote you again, a long game will compound small gains that will be able to overcome even, and I would even say in quotes, big, but you mean seriously, mistakes or losses, exactly. Yeah, again, there's there's a direct, obvious financial vector in this. But this also, same advice, applies to other things. And so you could, again, if you are, um, let's, let's, for instance, um, one of the values of, of doing art, say, on a regular basis is that um, you – can make some bombs. You can make stuff that's that's no good. You could be in a kind of a, a streak where you just nothing is very good. But if you do it every day, you're you're compounding your skills, and that will overcome even the you know the, the most um, horrific kind of mistake um, that you might make or failure. And so um, this idea of doing things on a regular basis. And a small things on a regular basis is 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 part of what the advice is about. And that could apply to exercise. That could apply to so like if you're doing exercise every day and then you get hurt, it's much easier to overcome that because you have built in this sort of compounding ability to kind of return to the gym or whatever it is. Yeah, and, fit. And, being and go fit, back. being stronger. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, really appreciate that. H- have you ever read or maybe met? James Clear or his book Atomic Habits. I am, of course, very aware of the book and a big fan of it. I have not actually met um, James, um, but I I applaud his 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 basic thesis his and ideas about making things as easy as possible, um, as um, habitual as possible, and and I think um, that that has been an influence on on my own habit making. And, and of course, there's good habits and bad habits too. But you know, going back to the investment thing, yes, that, that's very much true. And I think it's also really that advice is really good uh, at, for entrepreneurs and people who are who are trying to do something new and difficult. And that is is the same thing that that if you are, can construct your 
advance, to construct your progress in a way that it's incrementally compounding where you do things and you're not kind of waiting for a big payoff. You're not, you're not hoping for the, 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 the thing to come in all at once, kind of like yeah. get rich fast, but you're kind of getting rich slowly. Who wants to get rich slowly? Well, everybody should be because that's really the only way you're going to get there. <laughs> and, so, and so if you do this in a kind of compounding, then – Again, when when you have the disaster strikes, when 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 the lights you know or go out, whatever it is, when it's when you had your near death experience, which you will have if you're an entrepreneur, then you can overcome it much easier because you have built in this compounding slow gains you've been gaining all along. So you go back uh, ten feet, but you've been incrementally gaining it for each day. Resilience, obviously, the word grit in recent years has been yes. used to describe this, and uh, and it, it, the reason it's popular is because it's important and it counts. Yeah. Well, uh, two more, two more. Number seven, page two hundred two. This one you won't even find fast enough because it's so short. I'll be done before you get there, <laughs> Kevin. But go with the option that opens up yet more yeah. options. Yes. So. This is actually maybe a kind of a more of a theme of the book in general. There's a couple of themes in, in the book. One of is about, about the generous nature of the universe. And the second one is this idea of opening up options, which is part of what optimism is about. But the, the, the idea is, is that um, um, in, in my view, when I think about technology, which, you know, we're kind of taught here and there about um, again, a new tech. I think most of the problems that we have today in our lives and in the world have been created by the technologies of the past. And most of the technologies of tomorrow will be caused by our technologies that we're making today. And, but, but, and, and, and the most critics of technology would probably agree with that. But where I diverge from the critics is I believe that the solutions to those problems is not less technology, but better more and better technology. And those new and better technologies themselves are not immune because they will produce new and better problems. And so you so you might wonder, well, what's gained by all this running around where problems, technology making new problems, solving new problems, making new problems. And there's there's one fundamental thing, which is that we get options out of it, we get choices, we get possibilities. That's the difference between living in a city and living in a beautiful village in the Himalayas where they eat organic food and stuff is that you take the one-way bus into the grimy, gritty city and you have choices about what you can do. You don't have to be a farmer. You don't have to be a farmer's wife. And so, um, so that's what technology gives us and that's what civilization is giving us is increased choices. And so, and so what we want in our individual lives and society-wise, is that when we make choices, we want to favor those choices that will unleash more options. We don't want to close down options. We always want to make choices where we're increasing our options over time. Love it. Each time we make a choice, we are going to close off options. So there's there's inherently a closing off of options, but we want to be opening up more than we close off. And that is so, so, so when, when, when I look at decisions that I have to make, I'm evaluating it on what does the option scape look like? What, what, what it, it does going into this way, does it increase my choices and possibilities, even though that might close off others? Or is it going in a direction where I'm restricting the number of options that I have? And so, um, so I think, that that thinking in terms of the option scape is 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 a skill that we're going to increasingly come to rely on as we have more and more choices and possibilities before us. You know, I think about um, I, I love your point about the problems of today are better problems in some ways. They're also more right. complex problems, and therefore we need right, better right. technology to solve them. Some of the undeniable human progress, the yes, things really were worse back then, and yes, things really are better today, and only – we can't see it day-to-day in a protopia, but when we look a century backward, we see that many of the top causes of death of our fellow humans a century ago are diseases that have been eradicated. It's yeah. truly remarkable. We, we take for granted too often, probably every day – 
how much has been gained, how much safer this world is, even though we're all aware of problems with guns and other threats in our society today. But wow. So some of the problems of today truly are better problems in the sense that they're not as sad and tragic what we're actually having <laughs> to encounter as something like smallpox. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I, to me, there's nothing that makes me more optimistic than reading history. During <laughs> during during COVID, um, we read up and watched many many lectures on what actually happened during the Black Death, during the plague. Oh my gosh, it was just horrific in so many ways. Where I mean, it was very rapid, and you know, the entire families being wiped out except for one person. I mean, it was like. That, it was really phenomenal. And, of course, they didn't even have the highest level of living standards to begin with, but this was just really, really, really plunged them to the depths. And, um, and, and yeah, if you read anything about how slavery was endemic for most cultures around the world, it was really, really, um, really bad. So, so I always liked the Obama challenge, which is um, – you're going to be born somewhere in the world with no control over what rank you are, or what gender you are. It's like, what year do you want to be born in? <laughs> you know, it's like, you do not want to be born in the past. <laughs> you do not want to be born in the past where you're randomly going to be born somewhere in the world. And you, yeah. you know, most people had it really, really tough and particularly the women. It was, um, so, so if you, so you can see progress in that way more than just longevity, just um, control of your time, um, you know, uh, pain, all kinds of things. Before we go to our final quote, I just want to underline one quick investment point about your go with the option that opens up yet more options. One of the words that I've used regularly over the years for my own signature mm. style of investing is optionality. I know you know what that means, and I think a lot of people do too, but I don't think enough of the world understands the power of companies, and Alphabet is a great example, and Amazon is a great example, and many, ironically perhaps, of the best stocks of our time, the stocks that you want to have had in your portfolio, are companies that exhibit extreme optionality. It does seem with, as they go with their option, whatever their initial business model is, it opens up more options, to your point. Kevin. So, I want to make sure there's a real clear parallel in my fellow fool's minds here that what Kevin is saying about go with the option that opens up yet more options is awesome advice for entrepreneurs and for investors buying into certain stocks over certain others. So, I am a huge so, actually, optionality I buff. Uh, I haven't heard your, your, your definition. Could you um, summarize that to me in just one sentence? Uh, you, you, you hinted at it, but um, optionality meaning that uh, companies that are increasing the options in which they can do business. So companies that whose very nature is such that they have increasing numbers of options with their widget or platform or mm. cultural or, or innovative idea. Um, and so um, it was once pointed out to me by Andy Cross, our chief investment officer here at The Fool. He said, you know, David, the difference between you and Buffett, well, there are actually a lot of differences between me and Buffett that don't actually make me look very good. But he said, the difference between you is that you are looking for companies with infinite possible futures, and yeah. Buffett is looking for companies with one definite future. You think about, say, his candies or right, Geico right. insurance. Right, right, but right, I've right, always, right. you know, I loved AOL back in the day, my first hundred bagger stock, yeah, because yeah. I saw it could be so much more. Or Amazon started, you remember this, Kevin? Earth's yeah. biggest bookseller. Of course you do. So, right. so companies I was one that- of the first, I was one of the very first customers, because Jeff knew the whole Earth catalog and we were book reviewers. So, he <laughs> invited Stuart and me. And, and I actually have a history of my first Stuart purchase Brand. in 1995, um, um, and um, you know, yes, it was. But but I have to say, I did not see the optionality that Jeff saw because I was imagining it as as book selling, and anybody who saw beyond that 
had a bigger vision th- than I had. Well, and if I, I may I, say, if I may say, I don't even think Jeff saw what Jeff would yeah, see right, because that's right. part of the nature of this is that you yeah. kind of, as you take more steps toward the lighthouse, you still don't exactly know where it is, but you know that's a little brighter than where I just stepped from. And as you get closer, right. these are the words of Shirzad Shamin, the author of Positive Intelligence. I've always loved this metaphor he uses. As you get, you'll never actually get to the lighthouse, but you'll, there's more and more light. And so it real. I do think that Jeff Bezos did not know Amazon Web Services in 1995. No, 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 he he did not. But who was positioned, who was positioned culturally and with the ideas to actually take us there and get us there? And where will these entrepreneurs and these visionaries take us next? And you're one of them, Kevin. So that's why I'm delighted to hang out with you. I mean, I I, I like that that term and I would suggest, you know, I would expand it beyond even investment and even a personal optionality and say that what we want to have as a civilization is optionality. Love that. Is we, we want to increase the optionality so that we as a civilization are opening up options all the time, taking choices where we increase options rather than decrease them. And um, that may be something to keep in mind <laughs> headed into the current situation with China and Russia is to um, try and keep our options expanding. If you do come out with a sequel or a second edition and this line shows up, I want partial credit, just, <laughs> just a footnote, and it's this one because I'm, I'm basically just uh, magnifying what you and I just said. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah. go with the civilization that opens up yet more civilizations. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. One of the things that I think uh, in not the near future, but the far future, say 50 years, this is not that far, but say 50 years horizon is that we're going to see a, um, a population, global population implosion, and we're going to be competing. We, countries are going to be competing for people to, to come in, and cities in particular. And so I think um, this is a kind of Paul Romer idea that you have cities competing against each other with all kinds of tax and employment and you know, lifestyle things. But there's going to be a sense of, Cities saying, come join us. And so you'll, you'll say you want to live in a place where there's expanding options, where the, uh, you want to live in a place or a city where they've decided to try to expand the options over time. And I think, um, I think that we might come to something like that where we are thinking of this at a higher level of trying to um, have expanding um, optionality as, as an attraction to, to have laborers and companies are in some ways, you know, trying to hire are, are doing that in a limited way, but that's just for employment. But I'm saying, no, no, just for being an entrepreneur, for being creative, for investing, for working, for just living, you want to join a place where they are investing into increased optionality. That is so persuasive. And I'm really glad we got there. I love people who think 50 years ahead, and I don't think I'm going to be around. You might be around, though, Kevin. I just feel like <laughs> you've got the future figured out better than the rest of us, and I hope you're still around in, in 50 years. But I did a podcast a couple of years ago uh, called The Day the Market Crashed, and it was done from the year 2052. And uh, the market crashed. It was down substantially, but the joke is, of course— it wasn't a joke. We were trying to take this seriously, but the joke is that things had compounded so much from this day to that day that what sounded like a really bad drop, a uh, magnitude of points today that would scare us, was really um, not very meaningful that, that particular day. But we, we literally tried to do the conversation from the year 2052. So we were talking about how animals, we can now talk with animals. They've, uh, they've started reaching consciousness and they have a lot to say to us. And it's fascinating. And nobody ever thought we'd get there. Of course, we're totally speculating and having fun. We also talked about the power of Greenland. Clearly, back in 2022, they didn't realize that Greenland was going to, in a warming world, was going to be an incredibly valuable place to be. So we were having some fun, and that was half serious. The parts that were maybe not as serious but might still be true, self-driving cars still maybe going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think self-driving cars are inevitable, but here's the thing. This is a point out to me by Rodney Brooks, and I totally – Believe him. He the was one of the first man. guys to make you know commercial robots. Yeah. He made the Roomba. You bet. iRobot, and, one um, of my stock picks. And iRobot. And he's been you know at the forefront of robotics. And what he says is that the challenge with self-driving cars 
the reason why they're so slow and will be slow in coming is because you can't just swap out self-driving car for you know for a driven car just like we didn't swap out a horseless carriage car into the same infrastructure that the horse drawn carriages were we had to build an entire highway system on ramps gas stations and the whole thing and we're going to have the same kind of large infrascale restructuring necessary to have self-driving cars it's going to take a a lot of investment over time to accommodate them so we're not just sort of swapping those cars out and 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 expecting it to work so that's one of the reasons why this inevitable thing is going to take a while is um that there is more involved in just replacing the cars. We have to actually replace the entire transportation system. That's great. I think we also mentioned near the end of that episode that the iPhone maybe 48 was coming out and was going to have a slightly better camera. (laughs) (laughs) So let me spot you up with one more quote from your book. Then we're going to just close our our discussion with three Mm -hmm quotes from The Inevitable, your 2016 book, and ask you how you're feeling, where we are today. And you've been so generous with your time. I'm definitely running this week's podcast long because it's not nearly as long as I'd even want it to be. But regular (laughs) listeners know that when we go long, it's usually because I'm so enthusiastic as I am today. Mm -hmm. So, Kevin, here's my eighth and closing randomized quote from your book. This is from page 78. Kind of a fun one to close on. Writing down... One thing you are grateful for each day is the cheapest possible therapy ever. Right. Yeah. Gratitude. Gratitude is my only prayer. And I think um, it it is, um, it, it really is very therapeutic. It is very, very, very therapeutic to, to be aware of the grave. I don't know how it works. It's, it's sort of mysterious to me, but that act of being gratitude settles you, calms you, renews you. And that's just talking about you. The effect on the world when you're grat- when you're grateful to others around you, it just spreads and ripples out and it's and it's uh, it's contagious. And so um I think the, the my general my general view, as I said, I've decided to become more optimistic. And as I become more optimistic, I see the world slightly differently than I did before. And in the sense that I see how much it revolves around trust, how much, um, how I have a different idea or a basic nature, which has been backed up by some recent studies, which is that our natural human Inclination is not selfishness, but actually selflessness. That, 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 that's why we've has succeeded because we have trusted strangers, that, that we collaborate at scale, that we um, are able to meet someone that we've never seen before and trust them as a default. That trust is occasionally betrayed with cheating, but the little bit of advice I say is getting cheated every now and then is a small tax to pay for getting the best out of other people all the time. So they're going to give you the best when you trust them, when you're grateful, when you're generous and occasionally, yeah, you'll be taken advantage of, but going back, you know, what we're saying before that compounding abilities of that generosity, that's a small tax to pay. Yeah. I don't like to be cheated, but I will gladly pay that tax for the the benefits of trusting others first and um for you know for this taking advantage of this really weird thing about the universe that makes no sense whatsoever but it's absolutely true which is that the more you give the more you get okay mathematically that does not add up there's the arithmetic is all wrong but there is something fundamental about it that the more we give out the more we get back and and then doesn't you know how that works i don't know but that is the fact that i've seen in my 70 years of being everywhere in the world um that that seems to be some law of the universe at least among human relationships of course this is obviously not talking about physics i'm talking about human relationships and in that world the more you give the more you get and that's that act of being grateful for that 
and um, understanding that most of what success is, is an awful lot of it is luck. Um, and, um, you know, something that unearned in a certain sense, well said. Um, that, 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 that is the sort of foundational view, uh, or the foundational bias of, of the world. And I think I, I've become less patient with people who are convinced that people will always, if you don't protect your back, protect your back, they're going to stab you. That that's that the natural inclination for everybody is to steal, and this is a, another piece of advice: is that the easiest way to the easiest way to see the thief among you is the is the one who sees who thinks that everybody steals. Okay, <laughs> so no, everybody doesn't steal. Most people are honest most of the time. That is the fact. We know that people will help each other in a in a disaster, given all things being equal, and so we so so that's uh, that's something I've changed my mind about. I have to say. In, 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 in recent years is is not is, is kind of accepting the fact that, that the basic nature of humans as of today is is to be generous um, and collaborative um, and uh, given everything equal I really appreciate that I know um, I, occasionally you've mentioned publicly your Christian faith I think um, mm. I, I I share, I share it. Uh, We all come at things from different angles. Um, A lot of us are taught, not just in the Christian tradition, but others, that, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and we're all bad, and we're all fault. We're all faulty, that's for sure. But I really appreciate a fresh angle uh, toward selflessness and recognizing that. That, I think that opens eyes and hearts, and I, I appreciate you putting that out there. Let me shift to the inevitable now. I've been talking about three quotes. The, I mean, your book is so wonderful from 2016 and absolutely worthy of a rereading. I didn't do a full one. I just pulled a few of my favorite <laughs> pull-up quotes uh, to share with you. Before I do, I, I'm going to throw a bonus quote out from your excellent advice <laughs> for living because it reminds me of what you've just done for us. Page 164, you wrote, to be interesting, just tell your yeah. own story with uncommon Honesty, <laughs> and I believe that you have been interesting, and that's exactly what you're doing this week for us on Rule Breaker Investing. Thank you, Kevin Kelly. All right, so the inevitable. You and I uh, did a podcast on this. I mean, you have written an amazing book. You've talked about it in many ways. It, it brought your thinking together from years of observation, but you weren't looking backward. It was all about what's going to happen next and what are the inevitable yeah. forces that we're going to see in our future. And as I've often pointed out, talking about this book with friends, it's not genomics, chapter four, genomics. I mean, sure, genomics are probably inevitable and important, but it's things like filtering and sharing. If they're all gerunds, it's it's disarming initially for readers who thought they're going to learn what the 12 hot technologies are they need to pay attention to, including with their portfolio. So I really appreciate the orientation of the entire book. Um, the first quote I wanted to ask you about was about artificial intelligence because, of course, Chat GPT, etc. We've already talked about this some. You make art daily. I wanted to get into this a little bit with you. So, what you wrote in 2016, among other things, quote, to demand that artificial intelligence be human like is the same flawed logic as demanding that artificial flying be bird like with <laughs> flapping wings. Robots, too, will think different end quote yeah I, I would say further it's the fact that they think differently than human that's not a bug that's a feature that is the most important thing about them is that they don't think like us and we have the first inclination to that with chat GDP and you know making my art they make art that is a little bit alien so my my framing is that the best way for us to think about these coming AIs, and I insist that we talk about them in plural. There's yes. a variety of them, many Thank of them, you. and that that we think of them as artificial aliens. Who knows when aliens will land uh, on here? But we're going to make them. We're going to make artificial aliens on this planet, and they may at some point be conscious. And they may have some kind of intelligences and the super intelligences. But what's for sure. Is that they're not going to be human-like, and that again is the advantage of them: is that 
they think a little differently than we do. And that's, I think, important because we have problems, say scientific problems. What's gravity? What does gravity, quantum gravity look like that we may not be able to figure out with our own minds? We may have it to do in its two-step process where we make other kinds of minds, like other kinds of Spocks or Yodas, and we together work with them, with these artificial brains, to figure out some of these problems so that one kind of mind is not sufficient. We need other kinds that don't think like us. And by the way, we're connected 24 hours. I mean, basically, we have 8 billion people connected 24 hours a day all the time. And group think is a problem. And so being able to think differently is the engine of creation and innovation and entrepreneur. And it gets harder and harder to think differently if you're connected all the time. Having AIs on hand engineered to think differently than we do is going to be a huge asset in helping us to think differently. You know, what's interesting about that for me is that and I love your point about Alien, and I also enjoy your art. Again, follow Kevin on t- Twitter, at <laughs> uh, Kevin2Kelly. You or had, Instagram. Oh, on Instagram. See, I'm not there, so I don't think of that. Well, it's the, same, it's the same one, Kevin2Kelly okay, on Instagram. Good. Excellent, on there. Instagram yeah. as well. Wonderful. Um, you know, A few days ago, you posted what your daily art was what looked like this amazingly fun bicycle or um, yeah. motorcycle. It's red and gold. It looks like what every seven-year-old boy wants to unwrap for Christmas. The problem is there are no pedals that I could see, and even this yeah, seat right. looked completely uncomfortable. It's like a crotch rocket that no one would actually want to ride. It's really cool right. looking, but it's alien, ultimately. Yeah, and that's right. kind of what you're pointing out. But to bring it back to chat GPT, an irony, perhaps, Kevin, is that that alien intelligence, which, as you say, underlies AIs like chat GPT, in the guise of chatbots, are understandably trying to be as relatable as human, as pedestrian and friendly as possible. It started, perhaps, if you like, with Siri or Alexa. I hope I didn't just trigger that for anybody's machine as they're listening to us. But, you know, now it's increasingly, I I think, trying to be um, human and relatable. So how do you view that juxtaposition? So um, it's it's very deliberate. So so a lot of what the... um, the current crop of AIs and generative AIs are doing is actually not new. This, they've been able and capable of doing it for for years now. What's new, where, where the big bang is that we've noticed, is the fact that they have suddenly a conversational interface. The interface is a conversation. And we are naturally conversational beings. So Siri could understand language, but it couldn't have a conversation. And that's what this is. So, so now we have this conversational interface that we can bring to all kinds of things. You know, the phone, your, your shoes, whatever it is. You can have a conversational <laughs> interface to it. And that's, been, that's being the big bang uh, is having a conversational interface. The, 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 the AI part of it is only slowly improving, very, very slowly. What's really been magical has been this interface to it. And so um, the, 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 that was a deliberate engineering about what happens if you give a large language model, this, this language interface to it, what, what can we do that we didn't know we could do before? And it turned out that merely having that conversational way to get into the AI produced all kinds of things that we didn't expect. And, and it gave us a, a, a sense of intimacy and, of, of, and what I call these things, what we have now, is we have universal personal interns. Everybody has a personal intern. We we had we got the personal navigator with GPS. We got the personal librarian with Google search. Now we have the personal intern that could do all kinds of things, but you'll have to check their work. So I have a personal intern working with me on the AI, but you know I can't release what they're doing. It's kind of embarrassing just to give the first thing they do. So you've got to go back and forth. You've got to nudge them along. Do you really mean that? You can do better than that. How about this? And so these interns – are interns and they're not, they're not co they're, they're working with us and you have to kind of work with them. So that's what we're getting out of, out of this. The, 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 the next step, which is really, people are going to be very, very um, shocked by this is to start to program in um, emotions, more of a, of, of this kind of effect of, of humanness again, to make them easier to work with. 
So, you know, right now there's this question like, do you, are you polite to Siri and Alexa? Do you say thank you or please? Okay. But, but they're going, they, the engineers are going to begin to program this in because we have a natural affinity of working with, it's, it's kind of the human scale is to be conversational and polite. And so, and, and, and to have some kind of an emotional tag, an emotional layer. And, and, and that's going to be surprising because people for many, many years or decades believe that emotions sort of came after intelligence. But actually, emotion comes way before. It's like dogs and cats can have emotion. We can bond with them, and they're not obviously not as intelligent as us. And so we can put in that kind of emotional nuance and an emotional wavelength and emotional frequency into these things. And that's going to happen to make them easier to use. And will, that will be even more confusing for us as a whole because here are these things that are decidedly not human, but they're like a dog or cat, which are not human, and yet they can tug at our hearts and we can have bonds with them. And so we're going to have to kind of overcome that and understand that 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 dimension is not reserved just to humans, but it's kind of going to be open for things like animals and beyond animals. Let me ask you one more thing about AI, then we'll go to our second quote. Sure. Um, my son, Gabe, who's a very avid and, I think, interesting observer of technology, somebody who went to Cal Berkeley and programs and thinks a lot about not just video games, which we play a lot in our family, but, you know, what is it all doing to us and what does this all mean? And, um, and it's, sure. it's, it's certainly not an insight unique to him, but this was a conversation I was having with him the other day, just about how so much of AI, the AIs, are using human creation – uh, and curating yeah. that, the sharing yeah. that is one of your inevitable technological forces we're sharing, and ironically, perhaps, um, and pessimistically, if you like, and I don't because I'm, I'm an optimist too, but I try to be real about these things, arguably starting to discourage us as humans from thinking mm. and sharing if mm. – we start relying so much and thinking, oh, I don't even need to type into Wikipedia anymore yeah. because, hey, it's all just being done for me. And so the danger might be that the base of human creation that actually enables all of these AIs or many of them could itself become disconnected, disaffected, or just less productive. Um, your thought? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's an interesting uh, concern. One of my missions is to help us make our decisions about technology based on evidence rather than just what we could imagine. So as you said, yes, we can begin to imagine some of the things happen. So my question will be, is it happening? Do we have any evidence that that's where we're going? Do we have any, any evidence so far that because of generative AI and whatnot, people are making, say, less art. Well, one of the things we saw about chess, when, when chess came <laughs> along, it was very clear that the AI chess could beat any human chess, was actually chess has expanded. There's more people <laughs> now playing chess, more humans playing chess than ever before. So that was a, that, that's a counterfactual. That's saying, actually, so far, what we've seen. In generative AI, they're, they're by my own calculations, talking to the different um, AI generative companies, there's about 30 million images generated every day. 30 million images have never existed before, and, and they will never be seen again. The, 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 that's the weird thing about it is, is that um, um, these images, once you, you can't find them again. You can't get to them. But here's the thing. Because, because I've been doing this for a year. This is a recent realization that I don't think I've talked about. The, the realization is that right now, these, these AI image generators cannot get to, they cannot actually produce a lot of the kind of art that humans are making. And that's because they're being driven by language prompts. and. A lot of the art that's really great 
is like beyond language. There's no language to describe them. So you can't get there by putting in language. I've been trying to do that. I've been trying to make these art. And it's like, I don't have the language to get there. Okay. So, 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 so there is, there, 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 so far the evidence is, is, is that, um, I don't think it's going to, I think, you know, the human artists will begin to dwell in the places that the AIs can't get to. And this goes back to the artificial aliens. And then we need, we need them together. Together, me and the AI can get to a place that the AI can't get to by itself and I can't get to by myself. And so they are being trained on human-made content. The question is whether they'll be trained on the human and AI made content. That's one fear, and that's a that's a legitimate concern. Um, but um, I don't know if that's by bad by itself. But the other question that your son asked or concerned: Would are humans going to be making less, generating less, writing less, making less music if the AIs can make it? And so far, I have not seen that happening. It's possible. If it is, okay, we should reckon with that. But um, I can imagine it, but I haven't actually seen the evidence for that in my own life. I'm making more, I'm making I'm, I'm, I'm making the art that I can't get to with the AI. So, um, so I think it's worth paying attention to this space. It's a concern we should have, but let's look at the evidence rather than just imagine what could happen. And I think he would be the first to agree and he's very much an optimist himself so it's it's sure. probably more a speculative concern at this point i i do really appreciate your point from the inevitable we got briefly there to the ineffable because that's really <laughs> what you say can't enter art without things that can't be expressed as language so i i like You're, right, right, right now anyway i mean yeah. there are some ai generators that they're taking visual inputs and so it may be that you could begin to work visually and get there. So, so um, I'm just talking about what we have right now. And, and there are other concerns about the AIs and, their, um, and, and the fact that they're based on human content for training. And, and, and what I expect to see by, by, that, by the way is that you know, it's, they're trained on like Reddit. They're trained on the great works, but all, everything else. And basically right now these AI personal interns – make mediocre they, they, they generate the average human response which is not which is biased and racist and sexist and all kinds of other things because it's the average human and so here's the thing is that we are not going to accept that we're not going to accept it. we're going to say no 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 we demand that our ais be better than us not as racist not as sexist not as mean whatever as, as we are we want them to be better than us, but the problem is we don't know what that looks like. We don't have no agreement on that. We have no consensus on what that means. Is it wokeism? Is it post woke? Well, what does that even look like? And so, and, and how do we have a consensus about that? And I actually don't think we're going to have a consensus. I think we're going to make a bunch of different AIs that are curated in different training. It's, it's like educating your kids. Like, okay, this would say, no, only read the great works. Of, uh, of literature and this other one is no read everything so you know how the reality is i want i want to expose my my ai to everything about the human thing and then i'll we'll make values based on that and the other ones no 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 you can only read these things here only read the best only read the optimistic elevated ones and i think we're going to have a choice about which one you want to ask a question to you know and so okay that's good let's have let's have multiple versions I saw you asking that on social media. What are the books, if any, that you do yeah. not think we should be feeding in to an AI? Should yeah, we yeah. feed an AI Mind Kampf, yes or no? And the answer is <laughs> exactly. yes and no, because your point, Kevin, is that we're going to have a lot of different AIs. And so yeah. somebody might want to just interact with this one versus that one. I'm sure some could be self-destructive or just dumb. Others could be yeah. absolutely amazing or so amazing we can't even understand what's happening. But if we could, we'd be so much brighter and better off, perhaps. <laughs> well, listen, you've been so generous with your time. I did want to go deep on AI. I do before going to my last two, which I'm almost going to combine because I just want to credit you with at least one great call in this book. There are many, but one that is very small and personal, but I like it. I'm going to do that in a sec. But before I do, 
The phrase social media has come in for a lot of criticism. Uh, Jonathan Haidt and yeah. others saying this is a, a real problem. I'm just curious. Again, I'm talking to a rational optimist in Kevin Kelly, and I identify mm-hmm. similarly. What's your take? Uh, we'll just say 60 seconds or less right now. What's your take these days on the healthfulness or lack thereof of social media use? I think it's still too early to tell. I, I, I don't trust the, I don't fully trust the, the research done so far. I think it's biased to the U S primarily. That's the only place they can find data. I think U S has some weird things that don't represent the entire world. And, um, I think it's like health. It's really, uh, it's really kind of dangerous to rely on making policy based on one medical or two or even 10 studies on the subject. You need hundreds. You need hundreds to really figure out what's going on because the complexity of, of the medical and biological world. So, and I think we're at the same level of complexity that even one, two, or five studies is, not, is insufficient to tell us what's really going on. So I, I, I know from my own experiments in trying to like say, go through the social media, like the YouTube recommendations is I don't get radical, radicalized. I go, it finds that it goes in the other directions for me. It becomes more and more bland. So, so I think, I think there's still a lot more research to do. And, and I really, really, really promote this idea of evidence-based policy rather than just imagining what could go wrong. The same thing about unemployment. It's like, it's always a third person. Well, I, I, I don't believe my job is at risk, but my friend of a friend, they could lose their job. That's just, that's not, there's no evidence there. There's no evidence that really anybody has lost their job to AI so far. And so um, in social media, I know this is more than 60 seconds, but I think it's too early to tell. I really appreciate that. You know, Steven Pinker, one of the great moments in his book, Enlightenment Now, was speaking to how when you ask the average American, I realize this is just America, and I take your point that Americans can be weird and not necessarily representative globally, but if you take the average American today and ask them, are you happy, about 77% of us, at least in recent years, have said, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. And then you ask, are are Americans happy? Are your fellow Americans happy? The answer is like, (laughs) no, no, they're not happy. In fact, only something like 32% of us think our fellow Americans happy, but we say seventy-seven percent strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy. So this is uh, this yeah. is a great argument for evidence-based approaches. All right. Well, my my last two quotes from the inevitable. I'm going to read them back to back. The first one says said this quote: "Today we can highlight a passage. Tomorrow we will be able to link pages." We can add a link from a phrase in the book we are reading to a contrasting phrase in another book we've read from a word in a passage to an obscure dictionary, from a scene in a book to a similar scene in a movie, end quote. That's one I want to talk about in a sec. The other one, totally different topic, also interesting. We won't have time for it this time, but, quote, but there is one way in which socialism, in quotes itself, is the wrong word. For what is happening. It is not an ideology, not an, in quotes, ism. It demands no rigid creed. Rather, it's a spectrum of attitudes, techniques, and tools that promote collaboration, sharing, aggregation, coordination, ad hocracy, and a host of other newly enabled types of social cooperation. So just in the interest of time, I, end quote, I smashed those two together. They're different topics, but I wanted to, with the first one to say, you called it, at least you did for me, because I have really enjoyed using Readwise in yeah. over the last year. And this is a brilliant app where you upload all your highlights from all your eBooks that you've read, and it starts flashing them back to you in a very helpful way. So yeah, I did highlight passages. That's all I thought I could do for 10 or 15 years with eBooks. But now you said tomorrow in 2016, now I'm regularly linking one passage in one book to another. Haven't quite got there yet, of course, for like scenes and movies, although I realize I'm sure it's already happening because the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. But I want to say, I think you called it, Kevin, and do you use Readwise or anything like that? Yeah, I do. I use Readwise, and it is amazing, and it is exactly the kind of thing I was trying to suggest by that um, by the passage. To go back to the video part of it, actually, we need to go to AI because this is, I think, the real frontier 
these image generators that we talk about, making a little painting or a photograph artificially, we're at peak 2D. It doesn't really matter if they can make them artificially. The real, the real frontier is being able to, one, generate video in 3D worlds, like a game world, which is beyond the capacity of a single individual. So you or I, as single individuals, could sit down and we could write a novel, a full world, and it could be a bestseller and it could change people's lives and it would be an amazing story. But you or I alone cannot make a feature-length movie with the current technology today. But with the AIs, we could. We could actually direct them, these interns and artists and stuff, and to, 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 to make all the details, to fill out the room, to do the whole thing, to make the virtual characters. And so they're in the far future – will be able to somebody in their bedroom will be able to make an hour long video movie that comes completely from their mind like a novel would be but that's not really what i the related to what the passage you're relating to there's another thing that's happening with the ai and video and that has to do with with say youtube so right now if you were to google search for something and you want to search into YouTube, the most you could do is maybe search the title of something. But you can't search any further than you can't go into the actual content of a scene or whatever it is, like the way you can go into a book. Like Google search, you can actually search inside the book to a sentence in the book. But you can't go into the sentence. You can maybe go into the transcript but you can't go into the scene because it doesn't know it but right now the ais are at the point where they're going to google will then set the ais upon their youtube universe and digest semantically understand every scene so you could say to the chat you could say give me all every video scene where there's a magician pulling a hat a rabbit out of a hat with a spotlight and a black behind them and a, and a beautiful assistant next to them, whatever it is and then it'll go through all the videos in the world and give you, and you could then link to that because it would semantically understand the videos in a way that, that isn't possible right now. And you can begin to use it in the same kind of way of, of understanding and getting into and linking into that universe, which is the expanding universe. That's where all the content is expanding and people are making it. It's not writing Wikipedia articles. It's making YouTube postings and TikTok. And so that's the real frontier where all these new goods and services are going to be made. And if there are entrepreneurs listening, this is the frontier that's going to happen is when you have access in a searchable access and you can manipulate them and unbundle them and re repackage them and remix them, this content, which is in video form and right now is hidden from us in a certain sense because we can't search it. When that becomes searchable, accessible and manipulable, that's a huge, huge thing that's going to be coming next. When I say this phrase, what do you think? Web three. <laughs> well, that's web three. Web three is 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 I think uh, what I call the mirror world. It's um, I know the web three technically means like a decentralized version of crypto. I think it means uh, a, a spatial. I think it means the spatial web. Uh, uh, the web that has three dimensions, maybe four dimensions with time. So that's what I meant by Web3. And then the last topic, briefly, socialism. This is a phrase for a lot of us mm. in America, especially those who like to invest and like to think that, you know, I as an entrepreneur can create something that I didn't yeah. have to run through the government. I didn't need to be owned by the government. I actually had the freedom of the pursuit of happiness. And, other, and a lot of us associate that with capitalism, I traditionally have. I love conscious capitalism. Any listener of this podcast knows that. I'm on the national board, etc. These things. So socialism has never sounded like a good word to me until <laughs> yeah, yeah. until I read the inevitable, Kevin, where you talked some about how you know it's not it's not always such an ism, and it takes different forms, and in yeah. a lot of ways, it represents collective collaboration. And boy, if the World Wide Web isn't a demonstration of that over the last 30 years or so and going forward. So I'm curious if you want to update your thoughts on socialism. Right. So, so I don't want to – I'm not too wedded to the term. I was just saying 
you know, in the English language is probably the correct word to use, although I understand fully why it's been kind of shanghaied or, you know, corrupted by its association with the politics. But it actually is technically the correct word we should be using for what's going on. But maybe we want to rebrand it. Maybe it's, it's like um, social capitalism or socialistic capitalism, or maybe it's conscious socialism. I don't know. But, you know, there, there, are, there may be other words that could be uh-huh. used. Sure. But the point, the point is, is that in a certain sense, there is a huge socialistic aspect of capitalism. It's, it's, it's a cooperative enterprise, even though there's self-interest going, it is collaborative in that sense. And so when I see the general drift of technology in our civilization headed towards is more collaboration, more cooperation and at a higher scale. And that's, and that's, the exciting part is is that we are moving from doing things with groups of eight to ten to a hundred to a thousand, and maybe even moving to doing things with a million people. Wow! And whatever you want to call that, um, those tools that are needed, those cooperations, those institutions that are required to take a million people and work and have them work on a problem over time, um, we'll give a name for it. Socialism is. A technically a good term, but it's probably not going to be used. But the more important thing is to understand that this is a social thing. Yes. And that it's a high order kind of social interaction. And that is the group that is benefiting as well as individuals. And, 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 you know, that's been my refrain about the internet that was wonderful about the internet is one of the few technologies that rewarded and enhanced both the individual power and the power of the group at the same time. Well said, and it's fun to hear your updated thoughts. And indeed, I could easily go another hour and a half. I wouldn't <laughs> want to do that to you, though. And uh, and our listeners, I know, wish this could keep going, but this shall end for now. Kevin Kelly, thank you very much for your life's work because it's so giving. It's so sharing. You have demonstrated an ability to look ahead around the corner in a way that few humans that I know have, but you've always shared that. You're also optimistic about what you see. And you point out, as you did earlier in this interview, that that's a choice. That's a choice. And usually, most studies around health and happiness suggest that's the right choice to make, not just for our own constitution, but of course, for those around us, our families, friends, and the world at large. You are a living exemplar of that. And you are now a two-time guest of Rule Breaker Investing, the podcast. And I know it's not going to end here. Going to have to touch base with you much more often than every five years or so, Kevin, if you'll consent to come back. I know you're busy this week with a book tour. Congratulations on excellent advice for living. It has my five full cap stamp of approval. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. It's really a pleasure, David. I, I, I'm so honored to be included in you and your generous spirit. I really appreciate your generosity in sharing your own platform and in um, dispensing your own wisdom in a very subtle way. I appreciate that as well. And um, more power to you guys doing what you're doing in the world. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be part of it. Thank you for asking me to join. Thank you. Full on. As always, people on this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. Learn more about Rule Breaker Investing at rbi.fool.com.